So welcome everyone to Intermountain Fair Housing Council's discussion on affirmatively furthering fair housing. We're gonna talk about barriers, solutions, and hopefully this will be the start of a discussion um, so that in the future, we can discuss each jurisdiction, every um, city and the state's fair housing plans, um, looking at barriers to fair housing in our communities and possible solutions. And this is a chance for all of us to have a greater say in what's going on in our community and see how we can participate to make it more just. And with us today, I would like to thank our other trainer, attorney Ken Nagy, who's been our longtime fair housing trainer with us. Uh, we also have our um, ENO specialist, Sarah Jarzek, who will be providing um, some of our MCing um, Q&A and um, tech, tech, tech savviness. We also have with us our two interpreters for ASL, both Lavana and Sierra are here, and our captioner, thank you, Lori. We can't do this without you, and we're grateful to have you all here today. Um, thank you, we'll go ahead and present. Um, how many of you are um, aware of a firmly furthering fair housing or the requirement? How are we like beginners? Do we have kind of a meet, uh, intermediate understanding or do we have a expert fair housing understanding of AFFH? If you could put that in the chat. I'll just take a second to everybody kind of tell us where you're at and Ken and I will kind of look. All right, and just feel free to keep going. Next slide, please. So when we begin our discussion of, of fair housing, right? Of firmly furthering fair housing, we have to know that this is part of our mission. Um, as, as, a, as a fair housing organization um, and serving the whole state of Idaho, we too have to make sure that we are doing what we can to advance just access to our community. Fair housing doesn't mean just fair housing, it also means just housing. It means access to all the things that help us thrive, right? Fair housing is like the heart of the community. It's like your home, right? And without you having a home, you can't go to school, you can't go to work, you can't have access to clean water and air and, and things that make you either healthy or, or don't. And so those are things, you know, just to keep aware of, as we talk about fair housing, it's, it's the heart center of a community, your home, but fair housing under the Fair Housing Act, it's also the heart. And, and so we'll begin today by next slide. By acknowledging that a long time ago, right in the, from the inception of our country, we had already taken land from the first people who lived here. This is their land. And to this day, we haven't done what we should do to make sure that we correct our past injustice. And so we wanna always recognize at the beginning of all of our trainings, um, as many as we can, um, to recognize that we've occupied the unceded land of our indigenous communities. And, and it's important to, to correct those truths so that you can understand and try to remediate and heal what we've done in the past to hopefully make um, the reparations we need to do for our communities, our indigenous communities in the future. Next slide. Like I said, I, I like analogies and I was trying to say, uh, everybody's going, what is, what is a firmly furthering fair housing? Well, Ken being a practitioner of fair housing, right? One of the best fair housing attorneys in the state of Idaho and, and probably nationally, uh, we both know that the firmly furthering fair housing is a legal requirement under the Federal Fair Housing Act or Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act. And so if you're gonna look at the Fair Housing Act and you wanna see what the heart is, what makes, what makes what makes justice pump through our community, it is 3608 of the Fair Housing Act. Because if you don't have a home or if you don't have access to all the things, if all of your arteries and your veins aren't working properly, you get sick, right? So if those things are, are, are backed up, if they're injured, if they're cut off, if they're destroyed, if you eat bad things, if they're poisoned, it's really hard for your whole body to be healthy. And that's how we have to start thinking about our communities and our, our state and our nation. If all parts of it aren't healthy and we don't have access to all the things we need, we are continuing to get sick or we, we might not be as healthy as we can. So think about the Fair Housing Act in that way. It is the, it is the heart center, right? Through 3608, 
of your body, of your community. And we have to start thinking of it that way so that when we look at the, the barriers in our community that hurt not just, just, not just the people, but it hurts everyone. It hurts everyone in our community. Next slide. So what do we look at? Well, we have to, to, we have to do what, uh, how did we hurt our heart? Okay, so that's the first thing we, we have to recognize. To firmly furthering fair housing, we have to understand our history. We have to say, okay, what is going on and how did we get here? Why do we have people who are houseless? Why can't people, certain people based on their race buy loans? Why can't people with disabilities access the same opportunities in our community? Why do we have food deserts, places where there are no grocery stores? You know, things of that nature. Why is there, where are there people camping on the state capitol? Why don't they have access to housing? So those are all questions that we might ask ourselves. You know, why does our heart hurt? Why are people suffering? Okay, next slide. Because the, when we look at the Federal Fair Housing Act, it was passed for the very reason to end all of these sufferings, right? I mean, we knew for so long, since the inception of this country, right? Um, since the Civil Rights Act of 1866, that people based on race and national origin and these other protected statuses were discriminated against. They were barred from renting, from owning a home, from getting affordable mortgages, from, from engaging in, in fair and just land use decisions, for having accessible housing. And all of these, these classes are represented in the Federal Fair Housing Act. The Fair Housing Act protects us based on race, color, religion, no religion, right? National origin, sex, which includes sexual stereotypes, gender identity and sexual orientation, disability, familial status, or the presence of children under the age of 18. The Fair Housing Act was passed to make sure that we, as a country, and when we receive federal funds, we make sure that we are making sure everyone has just access to everything they need in the community and in a fair way. So that was the whole reason the Fair Housing Act was passed. Next slide. And we've gone over this, some of this, you know, when we first met on our first, um, our first training under this, this series. But you know, we know that where we live matters, right? Where we go to school, where we have access to, to food and, and recreation, it, the air we breathe, the pollution we're exposed to, it impacts our businesses, whether they're, they're thriving or they're failing. And it, all of these things meant even during the pandemic, whether we could go to school, have a job, have access to healthcare. All of those things are fair housing issues. Next slide. And the other thing we know is that when we don't treat the heart well, right, that some people suffer more. And I'm using this as an example. It's even worse for people with disabilities. It can be worse for people based on gender if they're in this class. But for black Americans, household wealth has barely budged in three decades. That means since the Federal Fair Housing Act was passed, since the Civil Rights Act of 1866, it is estimated that Black Americans have $6 trillion in, in household wealth. But meanwhile, white, white households have over $102 million in wealth. There is a wealth gap, and we're gonna talk about why that is, why there's this disparity. And there, it's, historically, it's been historically placed on us. Next slide. And what we know is that the, the United States government, along with smaller community governments and private transactors, actually conspired to segregate the United States. They actually, through land use decisions, created the system we have today that systemically discriminates based on race, national origin, color, and all the other protected classes. And that's been historically so prior to, to the passage of the Federal Fair Housing Act, and we know from the inception of our country. And if you haven't had the chance to read Richard Rosting's Color of Law, I highly recommend it. Or if you can, take a, take a view. It takes about 10 minutes to look at Segregated by Design, another project of Richard Rosting. But it's really important that we understand that even with the passage of the Federal Fair Housing Act, and Ken could attest, we've had numerous, thousands of cases, probably more than thousands of cases, that illustrate that, that discrimination is still occurring. 
And it, it occurs because we still have practices and policies in place, particularly designed during the 1940s and 50s and throughout the 60s until today, that systemically reinforce uneven lending practices, uneven rental practices, uneven insurance, pra uneven insurance practices, and every other type of land use policy practice and decision making. And so we have to look at what are those things that are going on and, and how did this happen? Next slide. And to be able to do that, we have to know what, what impact, what areas have been impacted the most. We know public housing. Public housing since, since the 1940s and 50s, when we saw an increase, right, in the private stock of public housing that benefited and helped, helped create uh, generational wealth started decreasing because we started reinforcing segregation and we started decreasing funding of it such that in the 1980s and ever since public housing funding has, has simply almost gone away. That's why we don't have affordable housing because there is simply no support or funding for it. That has impacted communities of color, people with disabilities and families with children and other protected classes significantly. They haven't had the opportunity that maybe others had in the past to build generational wealth. Zoning, zoning also as a construct, a discriminatory construct since World War II and the, um, since post-World War II had uh, segregated by design with the federal government and private transactors to keep people, people of color, people of various national origin, people with disabilities out of certain neighborhoods promoted single family use homes, but only particularly for white um, homeowners. And that's not to say that white homeowners haven't been affected by it. We all have, right? I mean, when, like I said, when one, one vein, one blood vessel is clogged, it hurts all of us. And so this is zoning has had a long, long systemic impact on all of us. And lastly, home ownership. When we talk about ways to build generational wealth, if the federal government through its programs starting in the, in the 50s and 60s did not lend to Black Americans, Latin, Latinx Americans, Hispanic Americans, Asian Americans, people based on race and national origin, women, people with disabilities. If we use discriminatory terms and conditions and we have reinforced them ever since, that is why we have a, a, a wealth, wealth gap, right? That's why we have an opportunity gap. That's why we have a health gap. And those things have persisted even to today. It was worse during the foreclosure crisis. It's even been made worse during the pandemic. Next slide, please. And so when Richard Rothstein and um, all of the, the fair housing groups and uh, people that are working on this, we're looking at that black people are likeliest of any racial group in the US to have their, their home application rejected. And we know without home ownership, you can't build generational wealth. You can't achieve the American dream. It's worse for black homeowners it's, and Hispanic and Asian as compared to white Americans. And this is even more so if you are based on your gender or based on your disability. So if you are looking at demographics and using um, disability or, or gender, the, the home application rate rejection is even worse. Next slide. So we're going to go over the history a little bit because we have to understand it right to go, hey, I can recognize when my artery is clogged. None of us are doctors, but, but we can try to know when we feel sick, right? Um, and, and be able to um, diagnose it. So the history of redlining is really important because that's how our government with realtors and insurers and lenders uh, discriminated or segregated America when they deprive people of building wealth through home ownership, and in many cases, even today, through renting, right? Because if you don't have good rental history, you're not gonna be able to use that to purchase a home and build good credit to buy a home. So these impacts have been historically profound from 1933 when some really key um, policies were put in place through today. So let's look a little bit, um, let's, let's take a look at some of those policies that have occurred. Next slide. So there were three really key housing policies um, in the 1920s and 30s that set in, set in motion the discriminatory practices that are pervasive through today. 
And one was from the National Association of Real Estate Boards, their code of ethics. And they use particularly a race-based discriminatory practice of uh, characterizing property and devaluing it based on who would buy or rent there. And this was based on race and national origin and color. And it was very, very problematic from the very inception and it set the catalyst for, for why there is a racial and, and uh, national origin wealth gap. The second, the valuation of real estate by Fred Babcock through the Federal Housing Administration, again, he had a policy that evaluated real estate based on whether someone was white or black. And it caused the, the segregation or the red line that we see today because it valued people or, and the property they lived on and the property they owned um, at a lower value than if they, for black people than if they were white. The same is true if someone was Mexican versus white. And so you can see this was a, a purposeful policy put in place to, to, to promote generational wealth for white homeowners and white um, communities as opposed to black communities and then further segregated those communities that were actually working toward integration. And the last policy put in place is the racial housing hierarchy. And when someone through the Federal Housing Administration as a Homer Hoyt um, designed was looking at ranking who was buying property and how it would impact land values. And if you're hearing about this today, you probably know about uh, discriminatory the discriminatory appraisal um, investigations. And during this time period, when Homer Hoyt was drawing up these basically documents showing how you were to evaluate um, a home loan, it looked at ranking people who were white at top and they would get the best deals, right? To simply put it, at the lowest rates, the most affordable and best places in, in a community that were healthy water, access to you know, good air, et cetera, et cetera. And people who were of color were put at the bottom. And as you can see, I listed some of the, the people in our communities that were, were devalued based on race. And so ever since then, this is, this is a set in practice, a policy and procedure to treat people differently based on race and national origin, from appraisals, sales, insurance, lending, and, and even into renting to today. Next slide. And Ken, feel free if you have anything to add as we as we discuss this. Yeah, I'll, I'll just jump in when we get to some of the okay. topics you want me to cover. Thanks. Okay. The next important thing we have to understand we discussed before is the Home Loan Corporation, the Federal Housing Administration worked in concert to give loans to white Americans at, at really affordable rates as opposed to people of color. In fact, they barely lent to people of color. And they use these really horrible terms, as you can see, um, uh, uh, bad, bad um, uh, history that we have of, of connotation through language they used of how they evaluated who would buy homes and who could not. And this type of language um, some of us learned recently in an appraisal training, um, discriminatory appraisal training, that so that we can recognize when appraisers are engaging in uh, discriminatory practices, shockingly are still using some of these words, not to, not to the shocking effect that they did back then, but are still using race-based, gender-based, disability-based discriminatory terms to decide who gets uh, their homes appraised at higher levels or not or lower levels. And so it's very, um, it's very persistent, it's very pervasive. And we have to understand that the Home Loan Corporation and the Federal Housing Administration actually did this with our, our private transactors um, in concert to make sure that um, white people had access to better housing and black people and people of color um, were excluded from the market. And this promoted racial segregation. Federal Babcock and Homer Hoyt, when you look today at redlining maps, um, which don't, we, we haven't kept track of those in Idaho, but we have a project through the College of Idaho, Boise Regional Realtors, and um, our organization um, and the Brokers Council, Idaho Brokers Council, to actually map where this occurred and um, these vestiges of this uh, racial segregation um, throughout the state of Idaho. 
Um, next slide, please. And as I said before, between redlining and sun and sundown towns, we had policies put in place by the Federal Housing Administration and administration, and then with local communities, cities, counties, telling people where they could live, where they could buy homes, how they could buy them, um, and limiting who owned, who could, who could uh, purchase a home, who could purchase insurance, whether or not they even had that access. And if, a, if Black people or people um, uh, who are Hispanic, uh, people who are Asian, if they had access to it, they would have it at a worse rate if they had access to it at all. Furthermore, and there were also sundown towns that were put in, start sundown town ordinances put in place along with CCNRs through real estate, um, uh, through realtors developing through um, homeowners associations. And that they were prerequisites for getting the underwriting for housing and, and for loans. And part of that was to make sure that communities stayed white. And unless someone um, in those, uh, in those um, city ordinances, um, had a provision um, for an exception um, for people of color to be there after dark. Um, they were not allowed. In fact, but in addition to city ordinances making it criminal, there were also, as we know, horrible, horrible uh, community members that would do uh, commit crimes of, of either killing, lynching, um, hate crimes against uh, community members of color so that they were kept out of communities. And so this further reinforces practices of segregation, hate, harassment that um, were prohibited under the Civil Rights Act of 1866 and, and up and through the, the passage of the Federal Fair Housing Act in, in 1968 um, and subsequently. Next slide. This is an example of, of uh, redlining by the Home Loan Corporation in Spokane. We don't have these maps, we're trying to we're trying to um, recreate them in Idaho through those organizations I mentioned. But if you look where, where the red line is, that's where typically black people were segregated along with sometimes Asian, Mexican, and the, as you could see, Italian um, and Irish, other, other, um, other people whom um, Fred, Fred and Fred Babcock and Homer Hoyt viewed as um, people who were um, you know, explicitly discriminated against. And as you see the yellow and blue and green, yellow was less worse, um, blue and green were better. And those were predominantly where white people lived. And it's really important to know that values of land um, and the, that in the blue and green were valued much higher and yellow and red much lower. And, and as you might surmise, this is true today. While it's gotten a little better, the yellow and the red is where typically where um, other hazards are being placed. Land use decisions are made to put um, hazard industrial um, hazards in those areas, or you'll see high impacts of asphalt raising the climate or the temperature in those areas, fewer parks, um, act more, more pollution. In fact, in many communities like this, where there's red and yellow, people live 10 to 12 years shorter than in the green and blue areas. And so if we don't do things to change that, right? Our, our, our arteries are clogged, our, our, our heart is hurting because part of our community is suffocating, right? They're, they're getting the poison, they're getting the bad water, the bad air, the, the lack of access to food, the lack of access to, to income through banks. Um, all the things that the, the white, the, excuse me, the, the blue and the green areas have where predominantly white Americans live, um, the yellow and the red don't have that same access. And if they do have access to food or if they do have access to income, it's usually pawn shops. It's usually uh, what are called food jungles through gas stations to get food. They don't have the same access to the quality um, opportunities that the others do because it was constructed that way through our government policies and private transactors. Next slide. Well, we know that people are, are doing what they can to change it, right? We've, we've got our civil rights ancestors who said no more. We've been tired of this and we're still fighting it through these landmark decisions and policies, Shelley versus Kramer, 
the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and 1968, after the assassination of Martin Luther King, we had the passage of the Federal Fair Housing Act. We thought, hey, we are now getting a promise, right? We are getting a promise to change the way we, we do things, to make sure that everyone in the community, right, er, that your heart is pumping with all the veins being clean, right? So that your head can think clearly, so you can, your lungs are, you can breathe, so your kidneys and your liver works well. But that's not the case, right? Even though we pass the Federal Fair Housing Act and we get money to all of our communities, right, from every city to the counties to the state to make sure our blood is flowing through our heart, it's still not, right? Even though this happened, even though we passed the Fair Housing Act, we definitely, we definitely need not only our community enforcement, but we need our, we need from neighbor to neighbor enforcement, right? We need to make sure that everybody has the same access um, so that everybody can thrive. Next slide. So right now, secondly, we have to recognize our heart hurts, right? We know where people are segregated. We know where people don't have access to clean air and water in our communities or accessible housing or are unhoused um, or houseless. So we have to recognize that there are discriminatory land use policies and decisions. Next slide. So I was really impressed when I um, was looking at some of the the research that was done out there. And I think the, the besides Richard Rosting's Color of Law, if you haven't read it, listened to his podcast, um, watched Segregated by Design, um, you really should. Because to understand this, you have to understand the history and how we undo it. It's not, it's not something that just happened, right? This wasn't some neutral act. This was like an intentional act by our, our, our policy makers. And it still is. But some people get access to good, good uh, neighborhoods and good air and clean water and schools and that it, it is a purposeful act. And so we have to recognize when this is happening, how to recognize it and then how we have to find solutions to undo it. And so part of this, part of the, the, the long-term understanding of this is recognizing that people will have shorter life exp uh, expectancies. They will have lack of access to food and water they will have um, they will have increased um, impacts with law enforcement and and uh, mobile crisis units and those communities their businesses their um, ability to thrive and have um, you know come through through this with better jobs and better education and and better health is diminished because they live in certain neighborhoods in our community or because they don't have access to the same opportunities that predominantly white communities do. And so we have to, through the Fair Housing Act, through our, our local governments, through our county governments, through our state government, through our national governments, we have to make sure that we have aggressive policies to end segregation and discrimination. We have to do that because we get money every year in our communities, at the state, at the county, at the, at the um, city levels, at the national level, to undo this, right? To work on these problems together. And we do this through community planning, through zoning, through our consolidated planning process, through our comprehensive planning process, through our fair housing planning process, any type of land, land use decision, whether an eviction is, is uh, whether an eviction occurs, all of those decisions are land use decisions. And in order to fight systemic discrimination, we have to affirmly further fair housing. We have to maintain affordable housing. We have to make sure it's beautiful and accessible and sustainable because housing stays where it is for hundreds of years. And if we don't have what we need and we can't age in place from cradle to grave, we suffer. And so let's so, look at some of the constructs that may or may not pose a fair housing issue. So, so time for me to jump in. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so um, I just wanna talk about uh, generally what is probably the most effective way of dealing with house, acts of housing discrimination, which is the, the complaint process, and that can potentially lead to litigation. Uh, I know a lot of people are litigation adverse, and, uh, and I've had it on a number of occasions, friends, family members will read to me some posts from social media where somebody's talking about what their landlord did to them. 
and uh, they'll ask me if you know my opinion on something and I'll tell them and they'll respond. And I don't believe in any of those dozens of situations, the individual who is really, really angry about what their landlord did, uh, in fact, ever filed a complaint about it. Uh, people whine about these sorts of things on social media all the time, but they uh, sit, often don't follow up. Uh, it's very important for people to follow up, uh, file a complaint, contact into Mountain Fair Housing Council, because uh, the cost of discrimination has to be expensive for discriminating landlords. Otherwise, uh, they will continue to uh, do the illegal acts that they engage in. And um, uh, about 10 or 15 years ago, Intermountain was uh, filing a lot of complaints because of uh, the failure to design in uh, accessible features in multifamily housing. And uh, one of the, uh, about after several years of filing complaints like that, one of the uh, big developers in the um, multifamily housing market said to the Fair Housing Council in my presence, you know, one of the reasons that uh, so much of the multifamily housing still continues to be built uh, non-compliant with these disability access requirements is because you haven't made it expensive enough for the discriminatory designers and builders uh, and, and I think that point really drives home the fact that although we don't like to think about having to resolve this stuff through formal litigation and complaints, that all feels very negative and people don't typically want to do it. However, it's very, very important that people follow up on these things because otherwise discriminatory, discriminating housing providers will continue to do the illegal acts that they do. Absolutely. And we're gonna we're gonna talk about a few cases just to give some examples um, later, um, and Kay may have some additional ones. Um, and and feel free if you have questions to to put it in the chat, and or um, we're gonna have a quick Q and A um, at the end. So please remember your questions; they're very important. Uh, we want to make sure that you get all of them answered. Thank you. And so I think it's okay if people post questions in the chat while we go along, right? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yes, please. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, so continue. So, so um, when the Alliance for Justice was looking at, okay, overall, what kind of issues, and this is not an inclusive list, they, they, they went and said, hey, to the community, um, there may be other land use constructs, policies, and practices that are also um, leading to or creating systemic discrimination in our communities. But here are some that they have mentioned. We've talked about one of them, which is redlining. Um, and even today, modern day redlining, right, where homeowners are buying in areas that are majority of people of color are given smaller loans um, to purchase housing than home buyers in white areas. We know that happened in the past, right? That's why we have um, communities segregated by design. This is true and reinforced by with restrictive covenants. And um, Ken's going to talk about a little bit about what we've been involved um, to remove restrictive covenants that exist even to today in Idaho in the homeowners associations um, conditions, covenants and restrictions and deeds. Um, and these were requirements, remember, by underwriters and the homeowner corporation to make sure that they were um, uh, kept segregated by race and national origin, um, mandating laws and public housing disinvestments. Next slide. Do you want to talk a little bit about the covenants? Yeah, yeah I'd like to, like to jump in if I could. Uh, the restrictive covenants, I think, is a really interesting aspect of or wrinkle to this whole uh, issue because um, the, we've got lots and lots of properties that are subject to restrictive covenants. Generally, they're properties controlled by homeowners associations, and these covenants may have been in, often are have been in effect for long before the Fair Housing Act banned the discriminatory content of them. So what that means is that those restrictive covenants are recorded with the county, they're of record, but the discriminatory provisions, in fact, uh, can't be enforced. And, and sometimes homeowners associations may try to enforce them. And that could be the basis for a fair housing lawsuit. And um, 
However, uh, these are these are statements of public record uh, that are hurtful, and they promote continued discrimination. They normalize discrimination. People read them and they think that well, this is a recorded document. Uh, it must be uh, uh, enforceable and it must be uh, acceptable. And so for that reason, it, uh, I feel, and a number of other individuals feel that it's really important that we clean up that language in these restrictive covenants. And uh, so there is in fact, as we speak, an effort by uh, um, the, an Idaho legislator to enact a law in Idaho that will enable subsequent property owners, occupants, residents to uh, take that language out of those documents that have been recorded and are of record. And I think that's really important and appropriate. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll be moving, hopefully that, that bill will be enacted. And, um, and if you think it's important, certainly talk with your legislators and encourage them to support the bill because this is going on literally as we speak. Uh, it's being considered. And, um, and I think that it's really important that we get that language out of the public dialogue, out of the public record. However, with that said, there are uh, a lot of restricted covenants that are continuing to be enacted today, which contain prohibitions on group homes for the disabled. And in my opinion, that's probably uh, the most common type of blatant redlining that's going on in the state of Idaho and probably all over the country. And, uh, and we can find these restrictive covenants very easily. You can search for them on the internet. And if you search CCNRs, which means covenants, conditions, and restrictions, CCNRs and put in group home, uh, you, you'll probably have a bunch of them pop up. And not only are they still being enacted, but homeowners associations are still trying to enforce them despite the fact that they're a blatant violation of the Fair Housing Act. And so um, uh, it, I, I think everybody needs to understand that that is a form of redlining. It is a form of discrimination. Probably everybody listening here today would cringe if they saw, saw a CCNR that said, no homes for black people will be allowed in this neighborhood. Why is it that there's so many individuals that are okay with the same statement being applied to disabled people? No, no group homes for disabled people may be included in this neighborhood. Uh, I find that incredible. And I think that's an issue that we've worked on for a long time and continue need to work on. Thanks, so. That's really good. Yeah, really important points too. And, and even though we have a state law that prohibits, um, prohibits that language, we still see it all the time, even though state law protects people in group homes. Ken and I and my colleagues and, and all of you who do this good fair housing work um, see it all the time. And it it's violates the Fair Housing Act, um, and it's something we have to address. And, if, and so if I could say one more thing, I mentioned Absolutely. that that's a, probably the second most common type of restricted covenant that we see still being enacted today are prohibitions that have, uh, unreasonably affect families with children. And so uh, we'll see restrictive covenants that say no children's play equipment may be out in the yard, no playhouses, no tree forts, things like that. And um, uh, that ha it, it may not be intending to keep families with children out of those neighborhoods, but it has that effect because if you are a a uh, parent that has children, why would you want to live in one of those neighborhoods? Because they don't feel welcome uh, to you. Uh, you're afraid that your children are going to be harassed. You're afraid that the homeowners association is going to come down on you if your child leaves their bicycle outside the house overnight. So um, th these are our conditions we see that continue to be enacted and it needs to be stopped. And so we, I wanted to give you an example. Um, this is a map of Denver, and you can see where there are still um, there's some improvement today of of you know integration in 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 Denver of where people of color um, and where people um, who are white live. 
but you can still see that there's redlining occurring, right? Where, where there are impacts of people based on race, where people are living in red and yellow <clears throat> as opposed to um, green. And it, it's reinforced. And, and what's concerning is this map overlaid with climate impacts, with redlining impacts, with other, um, other uh, areas, uh, poverty, um, like this one. Um, they almost over overlay from what was constructed during the Home Loan Corporation's systemic um, policies to segregate um, our communities. And so it's, it's really in incredible. Um, yeah, and the areas, Sarah had a good point, the areas that, that burned, right, are the areas where they are red. People are impacted um, by continued and perpetuated um, land use decisions. Um, that discriminate based on race, national origin, and other protected classes. Next slide. And so um, some other constructs that exist um, that may cause discrimination are urban renewal, predatory inclusion in, in um, lending, subprime loans, predatory loans, and the foreclosure crisis, all put together had direct and discriminatory impacts on people of color. The system is biased and it's biased today through the use of technology. If you heard about the Facebook um, scandal about who gets targeted to look at certain types of ads with whether it's rentals or whether it's you know, sales, um, people don't have equal access to information and the same, um, the same products, right? Because there is implicit and explicit bias in these technologies, those who create them if they're not, if in, in those communities who create these technologies are not diverse, they perpetuate their, their implicit and sometimes explicit bias. And, and the redress is going to be, be a long time um, project because we have to recognize that this is happening as we see it and who can get in and who can't. And that's true for people with disabilities being able to apply for for homes, apply for um, rentals. If all of you're doing is something that's inaccessible to them, it makes them impossible to achieve the American dream of home ownership and building good credit. One problematic way um, we do that is I want to emphasize is urban rural projects. We have to think of them, oh, they're making a, a neighborhood beautiful. But sometimes if they're not thinking about making sure that people in the community can participate in those decisions, They've actually been very racist land use decisions, discriminatory land use decisions, merely gentrifying and cleaning up areas where people of color have lived and thrived and had businesses and have access to their neighbors. And they've never seen the investment in their community except for just to displace them. So if we're not making sure that in our development, we're including the people that live there to also make sure their generational wealth is created through their business, through their housing, through home ownership opportunities, access to grocery stores, schools, green spaces, then we are perpetuating it. And we're pushing people around, right? Like food on a plate, but never really giving everybody an opportunity to eat it. Guess what? If you don't eat, you don't have the energy, your blood doesn't flow through the body and part of you is still sick, right? That hurts your heart. Next slide. So there, I just want to mention also that there's there's also a, a possibly even more insidious type of uh, urban renewal, or at least what's often called urban renewal, which is um, tearing down traditionally black neighborhoods to build uh, what turn out to be hazardous polluting industries. Um, oh, I know of no example of uh, a factory being built in a traditionally white part of the city. They are, as far as I know, always have been built in low income uh, neighborhoods, which are neighborhoods of people of color. Uh, they're sold on the residents as a type of urban renewal. And I think it often turns out to be a, a, a real curse for the people that live there. Absolutely. And, and some, some ones that we want to think about here in Idaho are um, the Silver Valley in North Idaho, um, where there were mining uh, mining going on. Not only did it impact people, creating pe whole populations of people with disabilities, but our one of our very large indigenous communities is in that area. 
The same is true in um, Boise, right, where the Blue Valley um, development was. While there are a lot of people who are white living there, they are people who are middle class or have lower income. But there were large, there was a large Latinx population. There were a large number of people, families with children, there were a large number of people with disabilities. And so Ken's right, you know, pollution affects some groups intentionally more than others because of our implicit and explicit bias. And some of these others we've talked about, um, gentrification, of course, um, a little bit about the changing of the neighborhoods um, based on whom we think should live there. And, and who should benefit from, from um, improvements and investments in communities. Um, also, what typically happens when we gentrify is land speculation, criminalization, you know, policing people out of neighborhoods or policing people differently, going easy on people when they're in white neighborhoods as opposed to people of color or people with disabilities. Um, and, and also evictions. If you look at patterns of evictions in communities, Typically, people of color, families with children, and people with disabilities are impacted more um, with low fault evictions sure. and here with expedited evictions in Idaho. And that's true all over the state. In fact, one of the highest rate of evictions per capita was in Bannock County. And they ha didn't have enough um, attorneys that they needed. Um, and our colleagues at Idaho Legal Aid stepped up and they made sure that in this population, right, where there are high numbers of people being evicted, um, and particularly families with children, people with disabilities. We have an, a large indigenous community, a large Latinx community that people had access to protect themselves from something that was specifically targeting certain types of people. Next slide. And it's really important to note that other constructs, crime-free leases, crime-free leases, if you haven't read Matthew Desmond's book, Evicted, um, he specifically talks about, through his um, MacArthur Genius Foundation Eviction Lab, how evictions affect people of color, families with children, and people with disabilities. These are constructs used, and HUD has, if you go to any you know, HUD training or had a fair housing HUD basic training with Christina Miller, um, she talks about how nuisance ordinances and crime-free lease addendums are specifically used, particularly in Black communities and communities of color, um, disproportionately to penalize people for things that maybe other people would not be penalized for in their um, communities. We already talked about the public housing stock um, being converted to private or underfunded, um, steering people definitely from one area to the other because of their race, national origin, color, disability. And of course, I'm gonna just say this over and over again, based on HUD, DOJ's policy on criminalization, um, when they provided guidance to us on how to analyze criminal screening, um, they found that this was necessary, not only for employment, but for housing, because people of color were disproportionately incarcerated, disproportionately severely penalized, disproportionately had longer probation and, and more severe probation. And this was affecting whether or not people could access housing. It affects whether or not people have education. It affects whether or not people can get jobs. And so this is another construct that keeps people segregated by design. Next slide. So I'd like to talk about steering a little bit more if I could. Yeah, sure. Um, steering is a really interesting prohibition of the Fair Housing Act because uh, it um, makes it illegal for a housing provider to send a person to a certain unit property, part of town, anything, uh, because of any of the protected statuses, race, color, religion, sex, national origin, presence of minor children, disability. You can't say, uh, I, I think you'd feel more comfortable in such and such a building. However, that's exactly what a number of the housing providers, particularly in Boise, who rent housing to uh, uh, refugees, refugee populations, um, uh, that's exactly what they're doing, and that's exactly how they defend their actions. They say, well, I don't have a problem with uh, people from that particular country, uh, but I just think they'll feel more comfortable in building where there's people from their own country already living there. Uh, they think that they're doing these individuals a favor, but in fact, 
uh, what they're doing is they're creating a, a modern type redlining situation. They're segregating people of certain national origins in certain parts of the housing complex, certain parts of town. And uh, that, that's all blatantly illegal under the Fair Housing Act. Um, and it's important for housing providers to understand that everybody has the right to choose where they're going to live. And that means that as a housing provider, if you, um, uh, if you have somebody of a particular national origin, they may volunteer that to you. Um, I, I don't believe it's appropriate to be asking, but um, uh, you still have to show them all the units that are available. Don't just show them the ones that you think are going to work for that particular individual. So uh, it's, it's almost like a type of micro redlining that goes on within uh, individual housing complexes where before you know it, all of the Middle Eastern uh, individuals are in one building, all of the African uh, individuals are, or families are, are in another building, and all the white folks are in these other buildings. All the families of, families of children are in this other building because that's sort of like, hey, if, if the kids are going to disrupt the neighbors, let's get them all in one building. And that's, that way we isolate all the noisy kids to this one particular building. Uh, that's all blatantly illegal. You can't be doing that. Everybody has a right to live where they want to live. Show them all the units that you have available. Because if you don't, and a complaint is filed with Intermountain, Intermountain will begin testing you. And Intermountain will get evidence that you are steering individuals and you will be facing a costly lawsuit or complaint. So yeah, I mean, and it's important like to make sure that you're attending these things and that if you see something that like that, that you're educating your communities so that they know they can't do this, right? That they know if there's housing transactors that are engaging this, they know they can't do this, right? They included some other constructs. Um, you may have heard of white flight and reverse white flight, right? Um, when, when workers moved into suburbs, right? Because it was, you got these great loans, right? To move out to the suburbs and it was fostered by the Home Loan Corporation and all the constructs of the Federal Housing Administration and the housing transactors promoted this. This, you know, allowed them to make up the rules about who they wanted in their communities through covenants, conditions and restrictions and sundown ordinances. And this really upheld racial, racial segregation. Um, it also, you know, made this disvestment in our, our um, cities and the reverse is happening today. Now cities um, are seeing an influx of white people returning to those um, communities, causing gentrification um, without including uh, brown and black community members who live there. Um, and it's then um, displacing them, right? It's, it's causing prices to rise and housing to become unaffordable. And we're not making the investments that we did in making sure that everyone can live in that community. That's the same is true for, for people um, who, with disabilities um, and families with children and people based on gender. Mm -hmm. And then exclusionary zoning is probably one of the most prevalent problems that we have in our country with single family um, housing and pro prohibitions against um, different types of housing, whether it's missing in the middle or teeny homes or ADUs or, um, you know, multifamily housing complexes. Um, those are really incredible different types of housing opportunities we have to have for all income levels, because if people historically, people of color, people with disabilities, people based on gender and other protected classes haven't had just access to housing and community, they will never have it if they don't have the same opportunities to at least rent or buy through affordable home ownership. And that's why we have to have some way through zoning to include them. We have to have inclusionary zoning. We have to have affordable housing overlays. And we're gonna talk about one um, example, what Boston's done to make sure that their community is more inclusive. Another way is through historic preservation. You're like, oh, that's a great thing where we're preserving this. Um, and, and I agree, like a lot of times it's really, really cool, right? We, we wanna make sure that that beautiful old church or that you know really great house, but sometimes the way that historic preservation has worked is to keep people of color out of a neighborhood. Next slide. My other favorite term everybody throws around, we've all have been accused on one way or other of being a NIMBY, a GIMBY, 
our, our other one, a Quimby, quality in my backyard. Um, and the other one is a Lulu, um, locally unwanted land use. These groups, we, we all have, they can be for people of color, they can be against people of color, people with disabilities, for or against. All of these things are used to keep people out of a neighborhood or to make sure people have access to a neighborhood, but maybe promoting and helping people who are predominantly white. And so it really takes a more um, critical lens when we look at why a land use decision is being made and who does it hurt and who does it help? And if it helps or hurts people who've been historically disenfranchised from gaining generational wealth, you have to question it. You have to question it because it's not as simple as it seems. And I'm gonna talk about a local example at the end, a case in point, but I want you to think about that because that's really important because it, mat it does matter about how you're framing it and how, who it impacts. And homelessness, criminalization of homelessness are both ways that, that people of color disproportionately have been affected by the racial constructs that exist today, lack of housing, lack of access to affordable housing. Um, and if you police people and they are put in jail or prison, it's far more expensive, it's far less healthy it's institutionalizing people. It's a violation of the ADA if they're a person with a disability as well. But it's it's more costly to our community to have people incarcerated than it is to actually house, pe house people in homes. In fact, it costs us 35 to 65,000, probably more a year to house one person in an institution than to have someone be in an affordable housing situation at 20 to $30,000 a year. We would save so much money if we would stop incarcerating and institutionalizing people. But predominantly looking at who it impacts. We must, must undo this, this um, discriminatory and racist practice. And the last thing is looking at, as we talked about today, environmental racism and health impacts it has on where people live determines how long they will live. And one consultant for um, one of the fair housing plans in the Treasure Valley let me know that there is a neighborhood in Ada County where people live 12 years shorter. And that's really concerning that just by your zip code, you would live less, you would live um, not as long because of pollution in the air, water, and um, the hazards that are in that neighborhood. And that's really, really disconcerting because guess what? That's where predominantly people of color live. That's where people with disabilities and families with children. And that is not a legacy we should, we should, we should prolong. Next slide. So I'm sorry, um, I'd like to mention one more thing about NIMBYism. Absolutely. And um, uh, also this is sort of like uh, on the micro scale again, I've seen a number of situations in which uh, not in my backyardism is applied to an individual or an individual household. And uh, for instance, uh, I addressed the situation for um, uh, individual who was uh, a former uh, substance abuser who was living in a small rural town and uh, the neighbors got wind of it. And uh, although she was on probation, could prove that she was no longer using Ill illegal substances, they decided they didn't want her in her neighborhood. She, they began harassing her. At one point, the mayor led a group of neighbors to march on the house and they began pulling apples off her apple tree and throwing them at her house. And I want to make sure that everybody understands that uh, that is a type of nimbyism, and it's being used to drive an individual out of the neighborhood. If any kind of harassment, violence, threats of violence uh, are, is used to, to drive somebody out, uh, that's all actionable under the Fair Housing Act. And it's even potentially actionable as a criminal hate crime under the Fair Housing Act. And uh, that, uh, if, if that occurs, then the FBI would investigate and uh, individuals could potentially be criminally prosecuted for actions like that. So uh, I see that as sort of a type of micro nimbyism that goes on. And people think they're trying to keep their neighborhoods safe. However, it, it is uh, often a violation of the Fair Housing Act. Thanks, Ken. 
And so we've already talked about some of these poor health outcomes, eviction crisis, disproportionately born on um, black women, head of households, but also people with disabilities and families with children and other people of color, gated communities. Gated communities were specifically created to keep people out, specifically people based on race. One example is what happened with Trayvon Martin. And so some of these things, right? I mean, we've got to start looking at these and recognizing these are systemic pervasive policies, practices, and land use decisions that are keeping us segregated and keeping our heart, right? The heart of our community, the heart of our bodies, unhealthy, unsafe, um, and, and without the ability to thrive um, justly, right? Um, concentrated poverty, um, under Title VI, it's illegal, but also under the Federal Fair Housing Act. We as communities have a duty to make sure that we um, invest in all communities, so all communities have access to sidewalks and good schools and safe roads and transportation and income and healthcare and everything that makes us thrive. Institutionalization, probably during the pandemic, it was, I mean, it was, it was probably always a problem, right? Institutionalization was always a problem throughout the United States and quite frankly, the world. But it was worse during the pandemic, right? Everybody was living in isolation. And that meant more people were put in hospitals, more people in nursing homes, more people in assisted living, more people in detention centers. And when they were in there, they were more likely to contract COVID. They were more likely to be de de deprived of healthcare services. Their, their conditions of health and mental health and wellness went down, their income. And all of these things made our community members who are the most fragile, predominantly people with disabilities, people of color, people based on gender and children were harmed and our seniors. And so really it's also so unaffordable. Like it's just simply an unsustainable way to house people and it's so expensive. It's fiscally irresponsible for us to continue to house people in this systemic discriminatory way. Next slide. So as we understand, right, um, these, these symptoms, right, as we recognize these land use practices, policies and decisions that are occurring in the United States, we can start being part of our community planning process, right? We can have a more informed knowledge when we go to zoning, uh, planning and zoning meetings, when we talk in community groups that where there's a housing decision or a grocery store to be um, designed and put in our community or um, whether or not we'll have access to water. Like if you have, um, have had problem with your wells, whether or not you will have access to, to water in your community or if you're facing pollution or you need accessible sidewalks, all of those things we can, we can look at to see why did it happen? How is it happening? And who is it impacting? And to do that, right, we have to, we have to recognize and understand our history. And I share here some, some really great, um, some really great books, Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States and an Indigenous People's Guide to the History of the United States. And of course, Richard Rothstein's Color of Law so that we can understand you know, what is fair housing and why we need it and how it helps us address the barriers to all these things that help us thrive. And I think one of the problems has been in land use planning, right, for our communities, when they receive these federal dollars, um, they had to get the plan done and, and fair housing was kind of a side note. It wasn't, it was a, it was a, it wasn't a, um, a checkbox in the way that it was um, a, a firm commitment. The Fair Housing Act and its heart under 30, sorry, 42 USC 3608 was supposed to be a mandate. Like it, this was your promise. When, when Martin Luther King died and, and all of our other uh, fair housing ancestors died, so that we might have those promises um, survive, we should be ensured that those dollars get used so that we all have access to community, right? Regardless of our race, color, religion, national origin, sex, disability, familial status. When our cities, our counties, our states, the federal government, the housing authorities get money they make a promise to identify barriers in our community that don't allow us to thrive and redress them. 
And we as community participants, as neighbors, as business owners, as employees, as tenants, as caregivers, as receivers of care, we have a say in that. It's legally mandated. And we have to use that opportunity to tell our government and the private transactors that work with them how we feel. Because accessibility, quality of life, your zip code should not determine how long you live, whether you have clean water and air, whether you have access to food. It should be in every community, every neighborhood, every county, every state, and the whole United States. It should be there for everyone regardless. That is the promise of 42 USC 3608. That is the heart of this. We all should have access to those things. Next slide. So how do we do this? How do we diagnose the problem and treat it? Well, we gotta be part of the fair housing planning process. Next slide. I'm trying to use these heart, this heart example to make it more, well, one, it's Valentine's Day, right, in February. But two, like, it's a hard concept to understand. But you know when your heart hurts, like Ken has already showed some really, given some really great examples of when your heart is like, it's like barely, you know, it's just, it's beating either so fast or it's hurting, right? You're, you're bleeding, you're, you're bleeding out. Well, Westchester County for years and years and years took money from the federal government, from HUD, making promises that it would redress discriminatory um, housing provision for people of color. And every year they would sign a certification saying, for, I think it was for 10 years or more, they would sign a certification saying, we are firmly furthering for housing. We are building housing for our communities of color in Westchester County. And every year they did not build that housing. They lied. So the Anti-Discrimination Center with Roman and Colfax, at the time it was Roman Day and Colfax, filed a false claim to enforce the county's obligation to affirmably further fair housing, right? This is really costly when it hurts. When there's a lawsuit and Westchester County has to pay up, not the community in a sense, I mean, the community does in a sense because they have to pay the taxes, right, to pay it, and they can't file for bankruptcy because we know from, from uh, uh, Boise County, you can't bankrupt, uh, can't file in bankruptcy to pay your, to, get, to do away with a fair housing or a false claims judgment. But they were forced to integrate Westchester County. They had to actually build, the court said you have to actually build no less than 750 affordable housing units in these predominantly white communities. You don't get to continue the past segregation that was constructed through the Home Loan Corporation and the Federal Housing Administration. That has to stop now. Next slide. Another example is in Sussex County. In the United States versus Sussex County um, and the Planning and Zoning Commission, um, Sussex rejected a 50 single family home um, residential development for predominantly Hispanic, uh, low income Hispanic community and people for black and Hispanic families. And in that, um, HUD found that the county had violated their obligation to firmly further fair housing by denying that plan, right? And so the DOJ sued the county for zoning law violations. And Sus Sussex was also found to violate Title VIII, which is federal, the Federal Fair Housing Act, or Title VIII, the Civil Rights Act, and Title VI um, for failing to comply with Title VI or limited um, English proficient compliance um, under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act based on race and national origin. And so DOJ and HUD jointly sought a conciliation, which is like a mediation agreement, um, and they entered into a voluntary compliance agreement. In order to get their money anymore, the city, excuse me, the Sussex County had to actually make sure that they committed to these remedies. They had to give the complainant $750,000, right? To make sure that um, they would benefit and have these uh, single family homes. They had to um, approve a subdivision for 50 affordable housing units to benefit um, communities that had been discriminated out of Sussex County and they had to exist in a high economic opportunity area, right? They didn't get to, to resegregate in areas of low economic opportunity. They had to give equal access to the high economic opportunity area, just like in Westchester County, which is a very wealthy, predominantly white county in New York. And then they had to develop a priority, right? A fair housing plan priority to address 
their impediments or barriers to fair housing that exist until today. Next slide. So what is affirmably furthering fair housing? Well, we talked about this already. It's, it's um, outlined discrimination based on the seven protected classes. And we hope, and, and most um, civil rights justice advocates, hope that it someday it will also include and are working to fight for sexual orientation and gender identity and source of income and other protected classes like so many other states provide. Because we need to make a commitment to people who have been historically discriminated against in our country. And it's not just enough to outlaw discrimination under affirmatively furthering fair housing, but we have to work together to undo lasting structural harms. We have to work to undo them. We have to identify them and we have to apply a treatment to them so that we can heal. And this applies to cities and counties and states and public housing authorities that get our tax dollars. If you get those tax dollars as a, one of those public entities, you have now made a commitment to affirmatively furthering fair housing. You have to actually do what you say you're going to do to make sure that everyone has just access to community. And it takes all of us. And there should be deep community involvement. That doesn't mean you just you know, send out a survey or you do something where where you have one meeting, you have to actually make sure that you go out to the communities that have been most harmed by these systemic practices so that they have a say in how it gets redressed because they need and can tell you the best way to provide access to education and housing and transportation and healthcare and all the things that help us live um, a good quality of life. You wanna add anything, Ken? Yeah, yeah, I just want to talk a bit about um, how the uh, failure to affirmatively further fair housing has been enforced. Um, I just want everybody to understand when Zoe talks about actions under the False Claims Act, uh, and she's made clear that uh, municipalities can be sued under both the Fair Housing Act and the False Claims Act. This is really serious business when you get sued under the False Claims Act because the False Claims Act uh, is a civil war or a post-civil war reconstruction era statute that the federal government enacted. It's that old, it goes back to around 1865. And it was enacted because it came to the Congress's attention that there was uh, a lot of swindling of the federal government going on during that period of time. Uh, individuals, carpetbaggers, were signing contracts to provide uh, materials, products, uh, you know, for relief after the civil rights after the Civil War, and in fact weren't delivering, or it was just a big fraud that was going on. And so what they did was they enabled private citizens to file lawsuits under the False Claims Act, and if they if if they brought to the attention of the federal government that this swindle was going on, those private citizens would actually get a portion of the recovery that the federal government got if they sued uh, the individuals who were swindling the government. And so when now when, when individuals or fair housing councils are bringing false claims act cases, what they're doing is they're saying, you municipalities, you cities, you towns, you counties, when you got uh, uh, money from the federal government to do urban renewal projects and other projects, you had to affirmatively further, you had to sign a document that promised that you were affirmatively furthering Fair Housing Act. And if you're not doing that, you swindled us and we potentially want all that money back. Uh, so far, we haven't seen the case in which the federal government demanded all the money that they've given over the decades and decades of providing federal assistance to municipalities that they've demanded all that money back. But it's it's a potential out there. And that could, for, for big cities, that could run into the hundreds of millions. I'm guessing it could even run into the billions of dollars that have been provided by the federal government over the years. I just want to really drive home how serious this stuff is and how you municipalities, you've got to get this stuff right because you've got an enormous liability out there. So you need to get working on your affirmative 
fair housing plans and make sure that you follow them. And know that all of us have a right to participate and give feedback to our communities um, on their AFFH planning. And so who has to, who has to AFFH in uh, Idaho? Um, well, anyone who receives HUD funds, right? We all have um, an obligation to make sure that we are meeting the mandate of a firmly furthering fair housing from executive agencies to departments of federal government, um, and anyone administrating um, a, a grant activity under um, the housing and um, urban development um, funding process. And so that includes the state of Idaho through Idaho Housing and Finance Association, community development block grant recipient cities, Idaho Falls, Pocatello, Twin Falls, Boise, Nampa, Meridian, Caldwell, Lewiston, and Coeur d'Alene, the housing authorities, counties, um, and smaller cities through the Idaho Department of Commerce. All of them are required to um, AFFH, meaning identify barriers to fair housing and come up with solutions to help us address them and make sure that there's a robust participation process so that you can give feedback to your community about what the barriers are and um, how to um, solve them. Next slide. So how do we do this? Well, we have to make sure that cities ha are fulfilling their fair housing responsibilities or any jurisdictions. We have to make it easier to give input. We have to make sure that people can give input in different ways, whether they attend a meeting, a public meeting uh, with COVID you know, compliant and as they can um, situations, surveys, emails, Zoom or online technology so people can have input in many different ways and, and in many different languages and as accessible as possible because everyone should have a chance regardless of their demographic to make sure that they have um, a way to communicate what they need in their community um, and potential solutions to redressing barriers and problems they have to access as well as resources. And so we wanna encourage people to make sure that you are making sure your city, your county, your housing authorities, your state, the federal government is making sure that you have access to the things you need to thrive, right? To addressing these barriers for fair and affordable housing and fair and affa affordable home ownership and all the amenities that everyone should have access to. Next slide. And, and so I just, I really wanna underline uh, the importance of doing it in multiple languages, as you've mentioned, because just in the last year or two, Intermountains uh, dealt with a number of very, very serious situations in which public input was gathered, but it was gathered only in the English language. There was no opportunity for people of, uh, of uh, other languages to provide input. We also see regularly city councils uh, meetings and things like that that, that are being conducted um, and sometimes there are issues being addressed regarding individual families where the city knows that the family is not English proficient or even uh, speaks English at all. Um, and, uh, um, and, and they're not making any effort to have an interpreter present. And Intermountain has to intervene and demand that their interpreter be present. And it's like the cities don't know what to do with a request like that, like it never occurred to them that they might have to have interpretive services. So uh, it, it's th this is really important stuff to get right, because how, as, as an elected official, how can you be certain that your constituency is even providing meaningful input into issues and decisions that cities are making, unless you know that people can understand the words that you're using? And so I'm going to jump off for just a minute. I need to take a short break, but I'll be right back. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Ken. Yeah, and the same is true, you know, at the legislature, we, everyone needs to have access to participate, um, whether it's accessible or because someone's uh, limited English proficient. The same is true in evictions um, or access to courts and land use decisions involving them. Um, all of that is critically important um, when accessing um, various types of, of governmental services in which they receive uh, federal funds. And, and regardless whether um, someone has a disability, there does not necessarily have to be federal funding involved. It has to be accessible. Um, and it's best practice that we make sure that we make sure our, our neighbors who speak other languages have access or our community members with disabilities. 
Um, one way to do that is to make sure in our planning, right, both our comprehensive or master plan, our long tenure plans, it's like, hey, we've got this diagnosis, right? Our heart is hurting. We got to have a plan to help for longevity, how we're going to make sure that it stays healthy. And in doing so, fair housing has to be the first thing you think about. Do we have equity involved in who gets what and how funds are being distributed throughout the community to make sure every neighborhood has good sidewalks and access to schools and, and access to, to income and business and things that help them thrive, right? And we have to make sure that we have goals and that we're monitoring those goals and achieving them. We have to have action steps to meeting those goals, particularly in land use decisions and regulations. And we need to make sure we're updating them every 10 years. Is it working for us? Because if we still have communities that are segregated, people unhoused, people getting evicted, lack of food, uh, lack of food in certain neighborhoods, <clears throat> there is still something wrong. There is still something wrong if people don't have access to transportation. And so when we revisit these things, either yearly through our, our annual action plans, every five years through our consolidated plans, every 10 years through our comprehensive plans, these are our checkpoints to make sure, are we fair housing? Like, are we affirmatively doing all that we can to address the barriers and eliminate the systemic land use practices and policies and decisions that have hurt people in the community, right? So are we doing that? And what are we going to do to redress them? What are we gonna to do to change it? And so we have to have these evaluations and we have to include the people who are most impacted by those decisions in our decision-making. We have to have robust processes where they can be involved and address these problems particularly people based on protected class, people who are underrepresented. They all need to be part of the boards that are actually doing the, the planning, who are making the decisions, who are addressing and designing consolidated plans and act, annual action plans and fair housing plans. They have to have a seat at the table and in fact should be guiding it. If people, if they don't look like the people who've been most impacted, you will not know and you will not address, you will not address the things that have systemically harmed those who've been most impacted. And you have to use assessment tools and specific data sets to make sure that we're not through policies that appear to be neutral, disparately or adversely impacting one group over another. Next slide. And so we have to have community involvement, right? We've talked about that. We have to make sure that we're not looking at through a myopic siloed lens just at community, but is it, is it impacting their environment? Do they have access to water? Are wells going dry? I'm gonna keep saying that. Do, is the air clean? We have to incorporate sustainability and environmental overlays as well as affordable housing overlays in our land use planning processes. We have to have a we have to have a framework. How are we going to do this to make sure that it is equitable and just for everyone to have access to opportunities for their well being? Do we have community involvement that makes it inclusive and is it equitable, not just for cities, but for counties, for state, um, for housing authorities? And do we have measures and time and effort to make sure we're meeting deadlines and working toward addressing those long term discriminatory impacts that have? Um, harms some groups more than others, right? And are we re-reflecting on data that we've collected and making adjustments, not only for people, but everything that people need, their environment, their water, their air, access to animals, farmland, um, things of that nature. Next slide. And in these master plans, as Ken, you know, as Ken talked about, we have to have an ADA compliance. We have no Olmstead plan in the state of Idaho. We have no Olmstead plan to make sure that we are not institutionalizing people. That has been for over 20 years. And if you don't have an ADA plan, if you don't have an Olmstead plan, the state can't be firmly furthering fair housing, right? Because they don't have any plan to uninstitutionalize itself. And that's why we'd seen what we did during the pandemic is people wholesale being institutionalized because they are being forced out of their homes into institutional settings or 
into higher and more restrictive settings. And so we have to make sure that we're meeting our Title II goals of making sure we have access to community. That means our housing developments need to be accessible. Our digital platforms need to be accessible. Our communications need to be accessible. This is a requirement, not only physical access to government facilities and programs, to housing, to food, to banks, right? We have to make sure all of that is accessible and also technology and the digital access. And we wanna also make sure that's the same with Title VI so that everyone can have access if you are not um, limited, if, excuse me, if you're limited English proficient, because this affects everybody, you know, communities of color, people with disabilities and other protected classes. And this creates equitable investments in our communities and public facilities in transit. So we have access to transportation, to parks, eliminating gentrification and protecting our well-being. Next slide, please. So one of the ways we do this, right, since the 1990s is through our consolidated plan, right? We're required to have a um, annual action plan and a consolidated plan and through that an analysis of impediments to fair housing choice. And that means you're going to identify barriers and you're going to come up with solutions and you're going to find ways to monitor it. Next slide. And HUD has done a really great job of providing an affirmatively furthering fair housing uh, link. And they've actually provided a toolkit um, in 2021 of how to go about affirmatively furthering fair housing. And this is super helpful because in it, it has an FAQ about how communities, cities, counties, housing authorities, states, um, national um, entities are supposed to make sure that they are identifying barriers, that they are getting data su to support and see who is being harmed and then implementing solutions and then kind of doing a reevaluation. So this is all HUD has provided this amazing resource. Can you go back for a minute, Sarah, sorry. They provided this amazing resource at that link that we've provided. I'll make sure that we send it out or we can copy and paste it and put it in the chat. They provide this really robust resource for us to make sure we are AFFHing, right? That we're helping our heart, making sure our arteries and veins and, and body is clean. Next, next slide. And so it's really important that we do these types of we do this type of assessment. I've already um, talked about much of this, um, but HUD recipients are required to do this. This is part of receiving that federal money that they actually engage in this fair housing planning process, that they actually have an analysis of impediments, that it is an integral part, not a separate part, but an integral part of their annual action plan their consolidated plan, their comprehensive plan, their plan of what the health of the community is going to be like. Like that you, you know, your heart, the heart center of the Fair Housing Act, the heart center of your home, the heart of your community is healthy. And so they have to, with this money, make sure that everyone has um, a say in what the barriers are and how they will go about being addressed. And some of the ways they do that are how they um, uh, notify us of uh, opportunities how they affirmatively market it so that everyone, regardless of their protected class and an accessible and uh, LEP compliant way have access to participate. Um, they have advertising requirements and then they have enforcement um, requirements to make sure that these standards are met and addressed. Next slide. And when they did this, they, you know, we've had this fluctuation between we had under the, um, Obama administration, we had the firmly furthering for housing rule, and then it was repealed by the Trump administration, and now it's been restored again. And they've made it um, much more, um, it's, it's again, much more accessible to create, to collect data and to um, make it easier to report whether you, whether cities and counties and states use um, a um, analysis of impediments format or an assessment of fair housing format. But what it does is it helps us um, look at um, compliance as not, not the same way as a, um, um, in a regulatory definition that was um, more um, difficult for cities and counties and states to comply, but more expansive of how they could meet this commitment and, and report this information in a way that the city, whether they were using the 
Obama administration's assessment of fair housing or the old analysis of impediments um, planning, they could actually make sure they were moving towards steps to improve um, fair housing outcomes. And so while the, um, while the, the um, furthering fair housing uh, require, program is not a requirement for participants, we know from, from case law, right? We know from the Federal Fair Housing Act that if you don't, right, you may face a false claims act or you may have your funding, um, you may lose your funding like they did in Houston when they weren't meeting the requirements of their um, of receipt of their funds to affirmably further fair housing. And so no matter what, what path they're taking, how they're analyzing either under an assessment of fair housing, an analysis of impediment, um, or some other form of fair housing planning, they want to see that you're doing it, right? They want to see that the communities are doing it and that they're involving community participants, particularly those who are most impacted. Next slide. So they made it really easy through that through their website to, to, to enable communities to participate. And so the last lesson fourth is you, we live, heal, and thrive by example, or what Dr. AFFH prescribed. We're now prescribing, right? This is what we have to do because we wanna heal the heart so that there is, and we, there is no more um, race discrimination, gender discrimination, any type of discrimination under the Fair Housing Act um, and under any type of Human Rights, uh, Civil Rights Act. Next slide. So how do we do that? Well, we make sure that we engage in best practices. And one of the best practices that we know of um, is um, this example from Illinois. Um, they had several important things that they addressed through their, their model fair housing, um, their fair housing plan. And one of them um, was um, uh, they addressed um, segregation. They actually had really robust recommendations for addressing patterns of segregation in Naperville. Um, and they had a um, way of redressing it um, through their development process. So they're making sure when they made land use decisions that, that, that their communities were no longer segregated. Um, they also looked at disparate impact. Did they have policies and practices um, using um, racial makeup, racial and ethnic makeup um, in the housing market that were causing um, people of color to be um, you know, segregated or to be discriminated against in um, housing and home ownership. And so they just they developed a strategy to collect and maintain data to track this and then influenced how the composition of where people of color in the city were living and trying to, you know, make sure that they put aid where it was needed and helped where where people needed access to home ownership and rentals. And then they affirmatively marketed it. They made sure that everyone um, had um, access to the same information and particularly people who were never getting access to information based on race, color, their disability, gender, because they wanted everyone to know of, of residential developments and opportunities in their um, community um, as a prerequisite to receiving a building permit or zoning or um, some other land use decision. So they wanted that, to make sure that anybody who was gonna build something made sure that everybody, but particularly people who'd been systemically disenfranchised from that opportunity to get notice. And then they integrated fair housing with all their city planning efforts. Everything, fair housing was first. They always thought of how this would impact. It was never a separate siloed approach. Next slide. So I just wanna jump in real quick. Um, when I see those types of examples like Naperville, um, it, it always really drives home for me the, the big picture of what's going on here with affirmatively furthering fair housing, which is um, if you do it, then you're a government, you're a, a municipality, you're, you're elected officials uh, who are really trying to figure out how to serve your own constituents at the highest level possible. Uh, you're trying to figure out how you can be responsive to their needs to, the, to what's going on out on the ground and figure out how to remedy uh, potential problems and, and also troubleshooting. I wanna give an example from right here in Idaho. Uh, about 10 or 12 years ago, I was contacted by a municipality in Idaho where they had a, a really dangerous uh, intersection and they wanted to close, the, the side street came down to a busy street on a sharp hill, a, a steep hill 
and they had problems with uh, vehicles sliding in the wintertime through the intersection and, and hitting vehicles that had the right of way. And they wanted to close that intersection down, um, block it off so that cars couldn't come through there anymore. They contacted me and said, can we even do this? Because we're going to be creating a, a lack of access for disabled individuals who are using the sidewalk there at this point. And we talked about it and eventually they figured out a way to do it where they could put in ramps and you know, close the, close the intersection, put in ramps and make it possible for pedestrians, both disabled and not disabled, to still have that access, but the vehicles couldn't. And that's really ahead of the curve. That's what you have to do. If you're not doing that, uh, you're violating the Fair Housing Act. You're also, you're swindling the government when you're taking government money, you're taking grants, block grant money and those sorts of things, and, um, and you're signing off that you're doing this, but in fact, you're not. So that's, that's what we want you to keep that big picture in mind uh, so that you can serve your constituents, your residents as, on as high a level as possible. When we talk to municipalities about whether they're doing this and tell them that they're required to do this, the response often is, we've never done it that way. Were we supposed to be doing this? We didn't know that. Get ahead of the curve. And more and more elected officials are getting ahead of the curve. And uh, municipalities are doing that. We want you all to be doing it. And that's what the Intermountain Fair Housing Council is there for. Uh, contact them if you have these types of questions. And they'll work with you uh, to help you figure this stuff out. Thanks, Ken. Yeah, next slide, please. Really good point. Uh, I want to give another good example because it's nice to hear about good examples, right? Of like people doing it, people or communities doing it right. Well, I've always wanted um, our communities to do regional fair housing planning. And I will say kudos to um, our jurisdictions in Boise, Caldwell, Nampa, and Meridian. They're going to work together on a regional fair housing plan or, and are working on a regional fair housing plan. But here's one from 2011 from the city of Portland, Gresham and Multnomah County. Um, and they had a robust fair housing um, plan developed um, to address some of the issues that we've brought up today. They have a really robust citizen participation process, you know, to make sure that they have um, community stakeholders um, and community members involved in how not only the methodology of how to develop their fair housing plan, but, but the in composition, like who the decision makers are. They also made sure that they were very well represented by all walks of life, all demographics, uh, people who were historically excluded, because as they say in the disability community, no decision about us without us. You can't, you can't, you can't be paternalistic and impose things on people that may not um, meet people's needs. They need to be able to say what they need and when they need it and how they need it. And so um, they did a really great job of including um, those who are most impacted by these decisions. And then they developed a technical advisory committee, people who were kind of experts in the fair housing field, um, housing programs, jurisdictional partners, um, housing providers to gather data, to find, you know, discuss accuracy, review impediments and recommendations. A lot of times Intermountain Fair Housing Council and some of our other civil rights um, siblings, community groups, we're excluded because they think, oh, well, they're an enforcement group. And if they listen to how they do it, but we're the ones, if we are the ones that are doing the educating and the enforcement, you should include us. We should be part of that fair housing decision-making. Um, you should include the disability rights community groups and the NAACPs and the, the you know, Idaho um, um, Immigrant Alliance and other groups and the disability groups so that you make sure you have those who need to be at the table there and people in the community. They should be your technical advisors as well. And you need to have, um, as they did an evaluation of segregation, they really did a really in-depth um, access to opportunity evaluation to see, you know, where um, they needed to implement programmatic um, and funding recommendations to address income inequalities. And it's not perfect. Everybody has seen, you know, you've gone to Portland, you've gone to Multnomah County, they've still got things they're working on, but they're taking the steps to try to redress them. They also looked at limited housing choice for persons with disabilities. Um, they're looking at how to tackle affordability, accessibility, and supportive services, and, and, and what recommendations should be brought forth. 
And then they're leveraging regional resources. And I think this is the most important. We cannot make decisions without um, making sure that we um, involve all of us working together. Boise, the city of Boise is where everybody seems to send all, everybody who's experiencing houselessness, but they can't be the answer. If all the other outlawing cities are sending their people to Boise because Boise has the housing resources to deal with some of the homelessness, but it's coming from Meridian or Caldwell or Mersing or you know, Mountain Home, they need everyone's help. They need the county's help. They need all the other cities' help. They need the state's help. They cannot do this alone. You can't build affordable housing in Boise and these other communities without having everybody help make sure that building is supported, well-funded, and that you have all the other supports in place to have just access. It can't be just one entity's responsibility. It's got to be a regional approach. And so if I, could, if I could just jump in with kind of Absolutely. the real world. Uh, I'm an attorney, so I always think, you know, the potential for litigation is out there. We know that municipalities are faced with uh, practically on a day-to-day -day basis decisions they need to make, and not everybody's going to be happy with it, with the outcome. And, uh, and sometimes municipalities try really hard to, to get it right, and they still are facing litigation because of it. But I, what better way to defend yourself but to show that you tried to bring all the stakeholders together. You tried to hear from as many people as possible, um, identify those groups, those interest groups, and get them to the table, listen to them. Uh, and and if, if I'm representing a municipality, which I do from time to time, that's what I want to see. They made that effort to bring everybody in and hear from them. Uh, it, it's hugely important. Okay, next slide, please. So I wanted to give you, Lori covered this, our last um, training with uh, Bart Cochran and Byron Fulwell about the Boston's fair housing overlay. So I won't go into it in depth, but if you haven't had time to look at the amazing work that Boston is doing to firmly further fair housing by actually having a fair housing overlay in their zoning and land use decisions, please, I uh, bed, encourage please? you to take a look. What are your bed? Sorry? Oh. Okay, um, so make sure you take a look at that. Next slide. It's a really, really exemplary, um, exemplary uh, uh, idea. And I just want to make sure that we take a look at that. You take that a look at that as well. Uh, one of the best fair housing plans um, that I can remember in uh, recent history um, was Valley Advocates for Responsible Development. They did one um, a while back. Um, under their Sustainable Communities Foundation grant um, from HUD, or excuse me, Sustainable Communities grant from HUD. Um, and they did a really incredible fair housing plan and, and I included a link to it here. Um, and they did it through regional planning. They actually you know, partnered with Wyoming um, and um, these counties to actually look at um, how the region was impacted, um, what the barriers were to fair housing and how to address them. Um, and then the United Way and St. Al's did a really incredible community assessment. And I don't know if you know this, but under the Affordable Care Act, hospitals are required to do a community, kind of a community needs assessment, their own fair housing plan, as you would say, their, their health equity assessment about what um, and how people are impacted, um, their health is impacted by community decisions from education, housing, income, Etc. just like the Fair Housing Act in, in, in some way. And so it's really incredible. If you want to look at that, it's very informative about um, kind of the state of, of how we are in the Treasure Valley, but almost every hospital has one um, around the state. And so it's worth, if you are doing an assessment of fair housing or you're doing an analysis of impediments um, or you're wanting to figure out how um, your community is being impacted, what the barriers and solutions are, look at these. It's very, very informative. Next slide. Again, here's some other resources from, um, for data gathering and informing um, and seeing who is affected by discriminatory land use decisions. One of the best is the National Low Income Housing Coalition out of reach report. It virtually tells us how our low income, right, our wages in Idaho and our really expensive housing um, affects us. And, and what it says is, Hey, state leaders, county leaders, city leaders, you got to do something about it, along with um, our community businesses. We've got to make sure that people can um, 
li have livable wages at the same time afford housing. This has got to be a, a community effort. And I, the Idaho Asset Building Network also has an incredible report, very similar to um, the National Low Income Housing Coalition's report. Eviction Lab, we got one of the worst scores um, during the pandemic for our COVID-19 response. And again, another really great way to look at how um, evictions impacted Idaho. Um, again, um, the Idaho um, Policy Institute from Boise State University, again, also did an eviction study about who um, um, the impacts of eviction in the state of Idaho, um, looking at the numbers. Um, the Idaho Supreme Court now tracks eviction data from 2016 onward, um, who um, and what counties are most impacted by evictions. And we hope they will add data, um, de demographic data. Who are the people being evicted? Who are the evictors? How is it affecting our community, having people, um, having various groups of people being affected by these land use decisions? Another one is Harvard State of Housing Report, and they specifically address Idaho. And it takes a look at how um, Idahoans are impacted, not only in home ownership, um, and rentals, but other land use decisions. And then the uh, Idaho Hispanic Commission um, also um, did a report on housing. Again, very informative about um, the Hispanic communities, um, um, how they're being impacted by homeownership and housing and particularly manufactured housing in Idaho. And then if you haven't checked out your city's fair housing and consolidated plans, look at them and then compare them to their CAPER, their report card. Their report card or consolidated annual performance and evaluation report looks at here are their goals and did they achieve them and they have them yearly and if you don't haven't looked at them it is a very telling way about how our federal money is being used to address impediments to fair housing if they say they're going to build 100 units of housing and their report card says they've done zero there's also a demographic data impact in there that shows who's most impacted by that. And as you would surmise, it's people of color, families with children and people with disabilities. And so you look at those because we need to make sure that we are having a say and addressing who is being impacted so that we can develop solutions and help remedy these long systemic land use um, discriminatory policies and practices. And then lastly, again, look at your hospital's community assessment or your bank's um, community investment act report. Sorry about the typo in there. Next slide. I want to make sure because we have a few questions and I'm trying to hurry and wrap this up. So I wanted to give you a case in point and I'll do it very quickly. And, and when we send this out or you can do it online, um, I went to, I was asked to do a, a, a given input and one of my colleagues was there with me and um, talked with a developer. They were going to do an affordable, uh, excuse me, an affordable development of 34 units in a small rural community, was very wealthy, um, kind of more like a Westchester County type place. Um, and I was there with him, the architect and the developer, and we're going to present why fair housing mattered so that they could build this affordable housing complex. And boy, I was not ready for it. I was like Shrek in front of an angry mob with their pitchforks. They did not want to hear from me because they thought I was here from this other entity um, that was actually going to be the property management group for um, this particular development. Um, and they literally during this meeting um, exercised their explicit bias toward um, the complex. They thought that there were groups of people that were gonna live there that they didn't want in their community because they thought they brought crime or they thought they brought you know, poverty or they thought they brought disease or they thought they devalued their, their, uh, their residential land, um, excuse me, their housing next door. And they, this residential community that was next door is a very wealthy single family home community. And they did not want this affordable housing development that was both um, market rate and also affordable rate um, in live standing right next to them. And it was being built, next slide, on, um, on land that hadn't been occupied for five years. Like the owner of the land literally had tried to sell it over and over again at one time for a hazard use. And they're like, no, we don't want that. And I, we would have been on their side on that because nobody wants anything hazardous being next to, you know, people where people are trying to live. And so, um, you know, this, this, NIMBYism, NIMBYism, sorry, not my backyardism, really was a barrier to these people to be able to access, um, you know, this uh, 
to create this housing that people needed. And in fact, it was so bad in this community, there were 120 people who used the food bank. 40% of the residents were cost burdened and 78 people were living there unhoused. They were couch surfing. In fact, they were in the meeting and afraid to speak because of the hate that was going on during this meeting. And the 34 families that would have benefited from this complex would only have served half of the amount that was actually needed, right? So they were there and they weren't even gonna build all the housing that was needed. They were just building a small portion of it. And we walked around town and we talked to people. I talked to store clerks, I talked to teachers, I talked to custodians, I talked to service workers. And they didn't even live in the community because they couldn't afford it. But if that housing had been built, they would have been able to live there. Next slide. And if they can't find housing where they work, they're gonna go find work where they live. And then that community is not gonna have their teachers. They're not gonna have their clerks. And so employers are gonna lose their, maybe potentially lose their businesses. They're not gonna have their custodians to clean, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so this, this prejudice acted as a barrier to the community that needed this housing in a really critical way. And we explained to the community members that people in their own housing, excuse me, in their own community needed this housing, their teachers, their neighbors, their service workers, their elders. And we explained that no study exists that shows that housing values go down when there is affordable housing complexes created. In fact, land values go up because people are housed, crime goes down. And it's critically important people's health is also better because people's needs are met. People are safer. Domestic violence and other violence goes down. People are healthy because housing is healthcare. And had the developers included the people in their pre-planning, if they had included us, if they included the right decision makers, the pillar of the community who was wanting to sell his land, who would have explained that he'd been trying to do this for five years, they would have been able to better assess the needs of the community and their objections. They would have been able to work together. We got them to start talking about design so that the light of the basketball court wasn't flowing into the, to the neighborhood so that the people felt like the, the design of the building matched the design of the other buildings around it and still allowing for the same units. That is fair housing planning. And that should have happened before we got there. You can address systemic racism through education. You can address it, maybe not always, but if you listen to where people are at, you might be able to alleviate their fears. And that's the beauty of the Fair Housing Act. That's helping us cure what's ailing us, right? Because people in our community should not be denied housing and access to the things they need to thrive. Next slide. We hope that you um, have learned through this um, particular discussion why fair housing comes first. It has to be part of all land use decisions. It has to be a critical part of how we develop, how we zone, our blueprint, our marketing, everything that we do to redress past discrimination and segregation. And if we haven't learned anything from Dr. King, it's that in order to create beloved community, we have to communicate community's needs in these most significant times when people are living unaffordably. The road to justice is not only a movement, but it is our final destination. And these are critical words from Dr. King and we must honor them because when we made that promise, right? When he made that promise, when we made that promise with the passage of the Fair Housing Act, we promised to undo the things that he died for. And so this is our chance through anti-racist and just community creation to create affordable, healthy housing and accessible community for all. And together we can do this neighborhood by neighborhood, city by city, state, county, regionally and nationally. We have to make sure that we put just planning into action. And this is the way we can stop unlawful discrimination. We're gonna go into an, an additional series um, talking about home ownership, and some of these other discussions about a firmly furthering for housing jurisdiction by jurisdiction. 
And we hope you can join us for that. And we want to take, sorry, we want to make sure we take some questions. It'll be kind of short. So, so can I make one final comment before? Sure. Okay. I just really want to stress how, uh, um, you know, hope, hopefully we make clear that affirmatively furthering fair housing is an obligation on, on everyone who's involved in housing. And that includes private housing providers. We've talked about the prohibition on illegal discrimination under the Fair Housing Act. Uh, there, there's uh, something that I think is going to become a larger and larger issue as the years go on. Uh, we know that all multifamily housing after March 13th, 1991, was all ground floor units was supposed to be built uh, accessible to disabled people. So uh, a lot of it wasn't and had to be retrofitted. A lot of it was, and, and certainly the newer housing has, is being built in compliance. But as the years are going on, what we're seeing is that those accessible units are starting to come out of compliance with accessibility because sidewalks are degrading, thresholds are increasing at doors. Um, there's you know day-to-day -day changes happening at these um, properties. Uh, uh, handrails and things like that are being taken out. And so uh, those private housing providers who own or manage all of that multifamily housing really need to keep in mind that they've got to keep those ground floor units in compliance by maintaining that uh, accessibility for disabled people. And that's, uh, I think, going to go far in increasing uh, people's access to fair housing and affirmatively fair furthering fair housing. So uh, certainly we can work with you on helping you to figure out how to do that, but, but really keep that in mind because as the years go on, it'll become a larger and larger issue. Okay, I don't think we actually have time for questions because we have to let our interpreters and um, captioners go on time. So, so if you wanna start your wrap up, I think now's a good time. So if you have questions that we didn't answer, please, um, if you could email us and we'll make sure we answer them and then send them out to everyone who attended today. Um, our apologies for that. Um, I didn't see the three questions in the chat, so I apologize. Um, I have nothing except for that. We are ending this series right now. We'll go into more affirmatively furthering fair housing and home ownership impacts. And then in April, we're going to do fair housing with an environmental justice lens. And so we hope you join us for that. Um, and we'll do more design and construction training as well. Um, please uh, make sure that you are energized to make sure Just Access Community is realized and fulfill the promise of Dr. King and all of those who came before us to fight for this incredibly important um, right that we have. And um, if you're interested in training, please, or excuse me, in tester, um, tester training, please contact us. Um, I put the contact information in the chat. Um, if you need AIA or architect credits or CLEs, um, please put your bar number in the chat or email me or contact at ifhcidaho.org. And uh, my apologies um, for not getting to your questions, but if you want to email us those questions, we'll make sure that we email the questions and answers out to everyone. Thank you. And thank you to um, Sierra. Ken, Sarah, Lori, and Lavana for all your amazing um, accessible uh, communications for everybody in our community. That makes it uh, so incredible. And we thank you all for attending. You're our fair housing ambassadors and you make us smarter. Thanks.